First of all, where he went. Look, we're just going to look at these first few verses. In verse 17, he went not just to the place where people were worshiping the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, not just the place where the God of the Bible was worshipped, but he went into the marketplace day by day. That's where he went with his faith, into the marketplace. Ah, what do we mean? Well, you know, one of the problems we have here is this word marketplace is just not going to evoke the reality because we don't have such a thing anymore. Not really. Uh, It's the agora, the marketplace, in Athens. Now, uh, what do we know about that? First of all, you have to remember this. Athens was the cultural capital of the world at that time. Yes, it had been... uh, It wasn't the power capital anymore because Rome had uh, taken over Greece, but it was still the intellectual capital, it was still the cultural capital. And in the midst of Athens, there was the marketplace, the agora. And one commentator puts it this way, on or just off the marketplace were temples, law courts, state offices, public archives, libraries, shops, concert concert halls, dance halls, gymnasiums, theaters, and galleries. Now who was there? everybody. And it's because there was no technology, really. Everybody was there. You had the town officials and judges deliberating. You had artists creating. You had the stock market right there. Businessmen, and businessmen, I guess, uh, were making all their deals. You had, you had the media because you didn't have newspapers, and therefore you had to go face-to-face and listen to the herald, heralds. You had the philosophers debating. Why? You didn't have journals. You know, you, you couldn't work out your particular field of thought through journals debating back and forth. You had to go to the marketplace. You had to have face-to-face deba- debates. You didn't have a stock market. You didn't have computers. You didn't have telephones. You, just, you had to go and actually make the deal. Everything happened in the marketplace. And Paul goes there with his faith. Paul goes there. Now, this doesn't make sense to a modern people because our idea is Religion is something, your faith is something for your private world. It's something that keeps you happy and gives you inward peace, but you do not bring it to the marketplace. Now, of course, that's not at all what the Bible does. What does the Bible say? Wisdom cries aloud in the streets. In the market, she raises her voice. At the head of the noisy streets, she cries out. At the entrance to the city gates, she makes her speech. And therefore, he was lifting up Christianity in the public place. Now, that's the first point. Your faith is for every part of your life. Somebody's going to say, and I, you know, I thought about this. I said, well, the trouble is Paul is a preacher. And so when Paul takes the faith into the marketplace, we see what he's doing here. But how does that help me? I'm not a preacher. And I, that is a problem. Let me give you another example, though, just to show you that the principle, though it has to be worked out in everybody's particulars, the principle is the same. In 2 Kings chapter 5, there's this great story of Naaman, who was the military prime minister of Syria. And he was a pagan, but he was also a leper. And he comes to Israel, and he finds healing through the God of Israel and through the prophet Elisha. And then we get to the place where he says to Elisha, now I know there is no God except in Israel. Now what is he going to do? Now there's two things Naaman does not do. And you can go back and read them and and what he does do, and I'm going to tell you. The first thing he doesn't do is he he doesn't say, Elisha, let me stay here. There's nothing but dirty pagans back there, idolaters. And he says, you know what my job is? As the military prime minister, every week I have to go with the king. The king is on my arm, and I have to go into the temple of Rimon. And there the king bows down and I bow down. I can't do anything like that. I can, I can never set foot in that temple anymore. I know the true God. Therefore, can I stay here with just believers? He doesn't do that. Nor on the other side does he say, well, you know what? No problem. I now have my healing. God has touched me. And it won't make any difference. I'll go back. I'll do my job. There won't be any difference. I can keep it to myself. There's no reason to rock the boat. He doesn't do that either. He neither avoids his culture nor capitulates to his culture. He neither runs away from his culture nor does he privatize his faith away from his culture. You know what he says? Now, this is something that I think both believers and non-believers are shocked at when they hear. What does he say? He says to Elisha, the prophet, he says, May the Lord forgive me. This is Naaman talking. May the Lord forgive me when my master the king goes into the temple of Rimon to bow down and is leaning on my arm, and I bow there also. 
May the Lord forgive me. Here's what I will do. Give me enough dirt as two mules can carry so that your servant will never make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other god but the Lord. Here's what he's saying. He is saying, I am going to do my job. I'm the prime minister, and that's part of my job. But when I go in there, I'm going to have some dirt from Israel, and my, my servants are going to spread it, and I'm going to kneel down so that everyone who sees knows that I am sacrificing to the God of Israel. He said, I'm going to do my job, but I'm going to let everyone know, and that's my way of showing people. He neither privatizes his faith, nor does he run away and stay away. He doesn't, engage, he do, he doesn't run from his culture, and he doesn't capitulate to his culture. He took his faith into his public life. He took his faith into the marketplace. 